How much do predictions impact the world? If you have a forecast about voting, it's going to change the outcome. If you make predictions about the life outcome of a patient, it will change the treatment you give them. There are different ways to be good at predicting. You can be good at fitting patterns in data, or you can make the data conform to your predictions. Dr. Celestine Mendler. She's a principal investigator at the Alice Institute Tübingen, co-affiliated with the Max Planck Institute and the Tübingen AI Center. She develops theoretical and practical tools to understand the interaction between algorithmic systems and society. Before joining Tübingen, she spent two years in the US as a postdoc at UC Berkeley. Previously, she received her PhD from ETH Zurich, where she was awarded the ETH Medal and the Fritz Kuter Prize for the academic as well as the industrial impact of her research. AI tools really have a transformative effect on society. We interact with them on an everyday basis. They make decisions for us, they filter content for us. Now suddenly questions about economic power, information asymmetries, behavioral biases, they really become relevant for the very theory of machine learning and prediction. Welcome everyone to the third episode of the Cyber Valley podcast. This entire series is where Cyber Valley gets a glimpse into the minds that are shaping the future of AI. I am Charlene, your host and the content creation manager for Cyber Valley. And throughout the series, we've been talking to principal investigators from the first ever established Ellis Institute, Tubingen. Now, for those who haven't heard of ELLIS, um, it's the European Laboratory for Learning and Intelligent Systems, which is basically a network of excellent minds in AI across Europe. Uh, but the principal investigators that we've been speaking to are located right here in Tübingen, Germany. So whether you're a seasoned tech enthusiast or a curious newcomer, join us as we delve into machine learning, robotics, and the profound impact AI has on our lives. Our guest today is Celestine Mendler, a principal investigator of ELS Institute Tübingen. Celestine, welcome. Hello, Charlene. Thank you very much for having me. So a quick background for our listeners. Um, you are an independent research group leader at ELS Institute Tübingen at the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems and at the Tübingen AI Center, Tübingen AI Center. I mean, that's, that's a lot. It's very impressive. <laughs> um, and you're also leading the Algorithms and Society group. So before we go into your research and the impressive things that you're doing, um, I kind of want to talk about first the hype that's been happening recently with um, AI, especially with when, since ChatGPT came out. And I think it brought overall awareness to AI, especially the field of AI. And um, I kind of want to know, how has that impacted your personal and your work life ever since ChatGPT came out? Yeah, so it really made uh, a huge difference. I think it's mostly like the presence in the media and in like everyone's mind. Everyone now knows about AI. It just made the technology accessible mm -hmm. for everyone. It just brought it so close to the people. I think this is what made a huge difference. Mm -hmm. And I also think it, it works really well. So I, I use it sometimes for like data visualization, for data tag formatting, or also for like small code snippets. So things that I would otherwise myself have to go and dig through the internet or read documentations of Python scripts. Uh, I think that's, it's very useful for it. Um, on a research side, I think it has impacted me less. I think it was less disruptive for academic research uh, than it was for industry. Um, of course, people have shifted to now work more on language models or NLP, but it's the sort of methods behind it. There's not so much of a change than in the perception in, in society, I think. Okay, yeah, but like you said, right now it's all over the media. It's at every single trade show fair that you that everyone goes to. And as an AI expert, what is the most exciting thing for you right now? I think it's this blend between technology and society. And this goes beyond G chat GPT. So it's also other kind of AI technologies that we've been interacting with on our everyday in our everyday lives for, for years, like recommendation algorithms on YouTube that show us which videos we should watch, mm -hmm. um, algorithms that filter news for us. Uh, it's it's everywhere and it's really shaping shaping society it has really a, an impact on society and what i find exciting is to sort of 
understand that better, understand machine learning as part of this broader socio-technical ecosystem. I think that's what my, my ambition is. And it's the fact that it's not anymore just like a descriptive tool, but it sort of helps people make decisions and decide, sort of determines what we know and what we see. Things like economic power, um, access, they just like become essential for the very theory of machine learning. And mm -hmm. this is what sort of fascinates me. Okay, but like you said, AI is more than just a large language model. And there isn't one concrete definition of AI. So, you know, people are using it in different with different names. They, they talk about it um, with robotics or intelligent systems or machine learning. And for you, what would be your one definition of AI? My one definition, that's a hard one. Um, I think it's one that regulators are currently struggling with because they're aiming to regulate AI. So you need to know what you want to regulate. Mm -hmm. um, I think more colloquially, it's been used as sort of the science of building intelligent machines. So machines that can solve complex tasks that are typically associated with human intelligence. Things like language that we've seen in ChatGPT, but also like co other cognitive tasks, uh, vision and also motion like robotics. Um, yeah, so that being said, I don't so much like the term as a definition. It's more describing an ambition or sort of a vision rather than like what the technology actually is. Mm -hmm. And that's why I find it a bit misleading as a definition. Um, so maybe the, the other term machine learning is something I like much more because it's, it emphasizes this learning component. This is something that was pretty important with the rise of machine learning, this paradigm shift from having computers that you program, that you actually, an engineer tells them what to do. And then there's a shift towards learning from data, learning from experience, learning from interactions. Mm -hmm. So instead of telling them what to do, you give them examples of what they should be doing and you let the machine sort of figure out how to reconstruct these examples. Okay. I think that's um, a pretty important paradigm shift and it also makes it very flexible because the data can be whatever yeah. Uh, and you can use it in so all sorts of domains, which makes it a very, very powerful paradigm. And I think this idea of making sense from massive amounts of data is often what's behind AI when it's used as a term. Okay. I, mean, I was going to say, I think for this podcast, for all intents and purposes, we will continue to use the word AI. Um, but I understand that sometimes it does paint a picture of, or unrealistic picture of what it can actually do. Um, but anyway, so yeah, um, can you tell me a little bit more about yourself and how you've become this AI expert in this field? How do I become an AI expert? That's a long journey. That's not just happening from uh, in one day. So um, I was excited about math and engineering early on, um, already as a child. Um, that's why I then decided to study electrical engineering at ETH. Mm -hmm. um, which is a pretty technical subject, a lot of like math background, signal processing, information theory, uh, control theory. I really enjoyed that. Um, I liked this small glimpse into research that we got. And then I decided to do an internship at IBM Research during my master's degree. And then they offered me to stay for a PhD. Okay. So I think the time my PhD at IBM in collaboration with ETH was sort of the time when I was introduced to machine learning. So the data science as a subject to study didn't exist yet when I, when I was at ETH. So yeah, it was mostly my, my PhD when I started. Um, I learned a lot about the fundamental algorithms behind machine learning. Um, I built, like, built a library to train machine learning systems efficiently. And so this gave me a very solid background on the, the fundamentals of machine learning. And then after my PhD, I moved to UC Berkeley for a postdoc. So I got a fellowship from the Swiss National Science Foundation for a postdoc abroad. Okay. And I, could, I had the opportunity to spend two years at UC Berkeley. And yeah, this also very much broadened my perspective. I mean, it was so nice to be in a different environment, get fresh inputs, new topics to work on. Um, I really think this 
this is what like makes you an expert in AI, just the, the time you spend thinking about it, the diverse inputs you get, the different perspectives you get. I mean, <laughs> I think that's the beauty of our job, just this never ending learning experience uh, as a researcher. Yeah, definitely. And your experience has brought you on both sides of the, of the spectrum. Uh, you've been, more, like you said, more on the industry side, where you built certain products of the IBM uh, research in Zurich, for example. And you've also been on the other side, uh, where you're trying to figure out how all this applies to the real world. Um, so currently, you're concentrating on the effects of what's of what you've constructed or built. Is that correct to say? Yeah, no, I think that's very correct. It's also very much in line with sort of my, my journey. Yeah. I really think this the experience at IBM was super valuable. So I just like to come back to that. We we built a software for training machine learning models efficiently uh, to scale them up and to train them faster. And the the tool that we built has now been integrated in like various IBM products. So it's part of what's an ML, it's part of IBM's um, cloud offerings, as well as like IBM C, this like high performance mainframe computers that they have. Okay. Um, so it's really cool to see how, how this has been like used and it has actually been used by customers. So there are like cases where some multi-billion dollar companies use it for forecasting demand. Um, so it's like a big um, department store chain mm -hmm. and it really helped them save save resources, save time, adapt their models very efficiently. I really think it's a very nice contribution and it was a perfect project to work on together with my colleagues at IBM that brought all the system knowledge um, that I could learn from. Okay. Um, yeah, and then I think for my postdoc, I kind of decided to stay or go back to academia and I kind of took a step back to think about machine learning in a broader scope, um, because it's not just about scaling and learning and efficiency. Um, it's also about the sort of environment the models are deployed in, yeah. um, sort of the social context. And I got very excited about understanding that better. And so in that sense, I'm now focusing on the sort of societal aspects of the sort of technologies that, yeah, I've helped building, I think, yeah. That's a good way to put it. That's so great, yeah. Um, and so right now we're sitting in Tübingen in, at the MPI IS building, and I kind of want to know how how did you get to Tübingen, you know, Baden-Württemberg, the land, um, yeah, and especially Tübingen, how did you get here? Yeah, so I ended up here because I wanted to come back to Europe after my time in the US. Mm -hmm. um, I have family here, was also my partner. And I got the opportunity for like a job here in Tübingen um, at the Max Planck Institute. So I knew Moritz Hart from Berkeley and I could join him here to build up his new department, um, which was a very nice, uh, nice perspective. So that's how I ended up in Tübingen. And I think the I decided to stay because I really like it. I think it's a very nice environment, a uh, very collaborative environment, uh, a lot of resources. It's, it's really, I think, a very good place to be in Europe. And now the new group that I'm building at Alice, it's a really nice position and I'm very happy to have it. I think it's, um, I'm really looking forward to staying here for a bit longer. Okay. And is it particularly important for you to invest in growing AI, especially in Europe? Yes, I think that's very important. Um, I think AI has become a very valuable economic asset. And I think it's really important to also foster talent and have like the knowledge here in Europe and not just rely on the US or China for major developments. Um, and on the other hand, I think there are always values uh, that go into these technologies. So the decision you make when you develop them, the kind of research question that you decide to work on, and I think it's very important to have this sort of European, Europe be rep represented there. Hmm. Um. Yeah. Okay. And so now you're leading the algorithm and society group. 
And for people that aren't really in this field or a researcher, they they think that uh, scientists or researchers, you know, go into a white lab with a white coat, and um, you know, there's a fingerprint touchpad uh, to get into the room, and you know, with iris sensors or things like that. Is that what your typical day slash office environment looks like? Yeah, not quite. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, so I spend a lot of time in my office with my computer uh, on my laptop. Um, too much time on my laptop, I would say. Um, yeah, so it's a lot of also theory work that I do mixed with like coding. Um, okay. I think when I actually work on like a research project, but so my job. So there's a lot of um, talking to people, um, advising students. Um, keeping up with the work that goes on in the field, yep. um, preparing talks. Um, I do a lot of visits to other groups. I think this sort of interaction is and discourse is super important because a lot of new good projects, they come out of discussions and maybe also discussions with people outside your field mm. from other areas. Um, what else? Yeah, so there is traveling is also part of traveling to conferences. Um, I think it's really nice to like once or twice a year go and gather globally with like friends and colleagues and learn about the latest the latest developments. Um, yeah. And how would you describe your research in the simplest of terms? So imagine that you are at a family gathering and uh, your family member is asking you, what is it that you actually do? How would you describe that or explain that? Yeah, so I usually say that I do research in AI and then they all expect me to talk about autonomous cars or robots <laughs> or ChatGPT now these days. Yeah. Um, and then it's always a bit hard to sort of um, come to sort of the fundamentals because the, the research I do is really at the foundations of machine learning. Okay. So what I usually try is I try to just explain a bit the basics of predictions. Um, I try to to show them that they interact with machine learning models on their, in their everyday life, when they use their smartphones, when they stream music on Spotify, they get like recommendations for playlist continuations. Mm -hmm. And if they use Google Maps, it, it's just like they, they interact with sort of these algorithms on a daily basis. Yeah. And then I try to sort of like sketch a bit the um, things that can go wrong, how there's a sort of a bit of a mismatch between theory and um, practical expectations. And I think that's exactly where these gaps is what I'm trying to fill with my research. Okay. And if we dive a little bit deeper, um, what exactly, can you give us some examples of your research and what is it exactly that you do? Yes. So one area of been particularly excited about recently are social dynamics around predictions. Okay. So what happens if we deploy prediction in in a social systems? So what happens if we use prediction algorithms to sort of allocate resources? Um, mm -hmm. So how does that change people's behavior? How should that sort of change the way we think about prediction in this context? Um, I think something really important here to note is that so predictions are not purely descriptive, but they can also steer users. So let's say if YouTube selects videos for you, um, you just see what they selected. So you can only click what they decided that you might like. Yeah. So there's a, a lot of this sort of um, downstream implications of algorithms on, on user behavior, which I think is very interesting. And this is something that has been, it's not like a new phenomenon. This has been recognized in economics, I think in the 20s. Um, Oscar Morgenstern in his habilitation, he wrote about- I'm sorry, who? Oscar Morgenstern, he was okay. like the, one of the founders of game theory. Okay. So he wrote in his habilitation about the predictions that can impact the target they aim to predict is one of sort of the fundamental problems of prediction in general. I'm struggling a bit because his habilitation was in German. <laughs> and so the statement was also the original one was in German. Um, 
But I think this is like a very important dimension and it's often neglected in machine learning because we often treat data as like a static object mm -hmm. and we don't take into account that the prediction that we make on past data could impact future data. Yeah, This is something that's often treated as a distribution shift in machine learning, but it could be caused by the model itself. And this gives rise to sort of interesting questions and dynamics about yeah, the, the way we formalize, formalize predictions. I think this, this aspect of steering is something super interesting and for, for the way we think about machine learning. And you keep saying that it, it directs people or it steers people in a certain um, direction. So when we talk about big events, like the upcoming elections in Germany, for example, or even the United States, and these predictions will form or can form our opinions based on what's set before us. So does that, can that have an impact on the end result for, for with voting, for example? Um, yes, yeah, so this is a theme that has been studied in political economy and psychology for a long time. So there are known effects, like for example, an underdog effect. Mm -hmm. There's also another effect called bandwagon effect, where you just follow the majority opinion and you're going to vote for someone if you think they already get a lot of um, votes. So there are different effects that definitely like expectations about the outcome of an election have on voter turnout and what people vote. So this is like an effect that's independent of like whether the prediction is made by AI or not, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think this is important to understand. So these are sort of dynamics. It's They exist, they have been studied. And I think it's just important important to be aware of them when you deploy machine learning systems because it's a completely new scale at which we make predictions. Yeah. Um, okay. And before you also talked about the socio-technical system and that AI is changing the system, is that what we're seeing today? Is this currently happening? Yes, so it has happened at many like small, uh, many small areas. So. For example, it has been documented in London when Google Maps was introduced that suddenly like small neighborhoods that never had traffic were suddenly jammed, right? There are a lot of like people following these predictions or there's a um, justice on Spotify movement just because Spotify algorithm tends to um, recommend already famous artists more often than newcomers. Okay. So this has lead, led to sort of movements in the artist community, um, just to counter sort of these changes. Uh, in finance, we've seen that finance predictions have really caused some sort of like financial crashes in the past. So I really think there is there is an impact like everywhere. Yeah. Um, and are there any regulations on all of this? Is this what your research is focusing on? I think regulation is is important here. Um, it's not entirely clear to me yet how to best do it. Okay. Um, I think what my research can contribute is tools to measure the impact of algorithms on society. Okay. Um, ways to formalize it, to think about it, to make it concrete, to make it something that you can yeah, really measure and or make someone accountable for. I think that's maybe what I my research can contribute. Okay, so let's talk about your accomplishments. Um, has there? Can you share with us a memorable moment or an accomplishment from your career um, in AI that's particular particularly meaningful for you? Um, I mean, meaningful, memorable. I think memorable is one achievement was um, when our library at IBM that we built was sort of used as a flagship project to sort of announce a new collaboration between IBM and NVIDIA. Okay. I think it was Think 2018. So that's one of these, that's a, a huge conference. You need to think of like 30,000 people attending. And then there's like the NVIDIA CEO on stage. There are a lot of VPs from IBM and they talk about how they're going to do great things in the future, collaborating. And then you see they talk about our project. You see sort of the name flash up on like these screens in this huge arena, which was, it was pretty nice. I was yeah. kind of proud of the thing that we built and the, the impact we could have. On a different scale, I think another even equally memorable experience 
was maybe unrelated to research, but I recently met the mother of a student that I mentored for a couple of years. And she was like, so nice, thanking me for all the support I provided to her daughter, how important it was, how thankful she was, how I was like a role model for her daughter, which was really nice. I think I really give a lot of like satisfaction back. Yeah, of course, of really being nice. a mentor. That's yes. great, yeah. And so in general, um, this field of science or this field of AI is primarily dominated by men. And what has your experience been like as a female researcher in this field? Yeah, it's true, it's predominantly men. It depends a bit on the area that you're in. Um, for me, it was not so much a topic, I have to say. I was, um, I had the privilege of being, having like incredible mentors throughout my career. Mm -hmm. And it was mostly men, uh, but I really felt a lot of support and a very professional environment. It was not, it was really not so much, I was just uh, one of the researchers, one of the scientists. Okay, part of the team part of the team. Mm. And I really think that's, I really appreciate that. And I think that's a culture that I want to, I want to keep, um, keep living. Uh, I think that's nice. Um, yeah, one thing that's always nice is to have more senior female researchers in the field that yeah. you can get advice from that you can talk to exchange. Um, and I hope I can be that for like some young scientists, this, this example of, of a good, a good researcher mm -hmm. of like a successful, yeah, a successful researcher. I think that's how I want to be seen. Yeah, definitely. And so now I kind of want to step away from uh, your research and I kind of want to talk about just the fears or the misconceptions or the, the concerns that people may have about AI. And one of them that I, continuously hear is that people think that AI is just this perfect um, system that, you know, it will never make mistakes. But bias is a big topic in this field when it relates to AI and its algorithms. And our previous guests have discussed um, the challenges of creating an unbiased algorithm. And how would you address this topic? Yeah, so it's a very important, it's a very important topic. Um, and I think to understand it, it's important to understand how the technology works. Because the systems are trained on data. They are trained on um, to detect patterns, patterns in data and project it into the future. And I think they're only as good as the data that we feed in. Mm -hmm. um, and ChatGPT has been trained on all of the internet. I yeah. mean, you can imagine what sort of content there is. I mean, there is toxic content, there is false content, there is, there's just a lot of, it's hard to control it. Yeah. And it's just really important to, to know that a, a machine learning model is giving you the most likely, likely action, the most likely answer. So if you let a machine learning model figure out who to recommend a job ad to, right? It's, if it's a CS job, it's more likely for like maybe a male applicant to respond to it. And even if it's just like a little bit more likely, or if in the past, let's put it that way, if in the past more males have responded to such job ads than females, mm -hmm. it learns that correctly and it will take the better option, right? That yeah. gives, has a higher expected return. Okay. This is just like, a natural thing for an algorithm to do. And I think it's it's very important for us to think about what we want from these systems and how we can sort of work that into the technology. Yeah, okay. And but it's not, so yeah. just to add, it's not yeah. like it, the, the system are, even if they do what we expect them to do, to just reflect the data, um, I think this can happen. Yeah, okay. And what about the social inequality aspects? So, um, some may have better access to AI advancements, and therefore that widens the gap between the people that can have the, the access to these and the people that don't. And so it can create advantages for some people. What do you what do you think about this? Yeah, I think the power imbalance I'm even more worried about is the owners of like digital platforms and the users. Okay, right. That there's the 
this becomes very apparent on gig platforms mm -hmm. um, where there's like a firm operating a platform that sort of matches drivers on one side and consumers on the other side. Okay. Right. Can be like Uber, can be DoorDash, can be all sorts of these platforms that emerge. And there, there's really a huge information asymmetry and the, the algorithm can really um, by being personalized, uh, there's really a very high margin that they get for their business. Okay. And so one kind of trend that we've seen evolving is that sort of drivers and users of the platform, they, they gather and they sort of share information, they deploy coordinated strategies to sort of counter this power imbalance a bit. Okay. And I think there is a lever because these platforms also rely on our data. Yeah. So there is some sort of uh, leverage we have through data to influence the, the platforms and algorithms. Okay. And what about privacy concerns? Um, there is this fear or this concern that AI um, infringes on personal privacy through data coll collection, surveillance, and profiling. How do these safety concerns impact the development or the deployment of, you know, an algorithm or a system or, yeah. Yeah, so data is necessary to build AI systems. So somehow having constraints on the data that's available is definitely like making it harder to build systems, but it's also like very valid concerns. I think it's, it's one of the really pressing concerns about, for example, ChatGPT and other generative AI uh, mm. methods that they take in copyright content, yeah, right, and they reproduce new things derived from it, or in the worst case, even like give it out as is. Yeah. So there have been like documented examples where, for example, writers were putting in the beginning of of like a book, and ChatGPT was very faithfully just like completing a few pages, right? It okay. was just, you could just get out this information. And I think this is a very important concern. I don't have a solution, but I think it's something we, we have to fix. And you may not have a solution, but are, are people thinking about these solutions? Um, yes, so people are thinking about some solutions. I think you've, you've talked to Jonas Geiping in the last episode. So mm -hmm. he's working on, on various things, but like one direction is watermarking. Yes. Um, which is like trying to make sure that you can at least detect whether content was generated from a model or not. Okay. Um, so this is like, I think, a, an important step in that direction to sort of be able to know what's real, what's generated. Yeah. Also, if you use it in the future to sort of, because in the future there will be a bit of a blend of generated and real content. And if you train models in the future on this like mix of data, yeah, I think this will be important to know. Okay. And what about uh, the fear that AI will pass or surpass human intelligence? Um, you know, there's a, an uncertainty of how AI systems make decisions, and there's the potential po the potential um, risk of unpredictable or uncontrollable risks. And how? What would you? What, what do you think about that? Yeah, I don't think I have much to say. Um, to this. This is just so far from what it is that I, I can't make a statement on on this. I We don't even know what intelligence is. So, I mean, we, we've talked about intelligent systems as machines that can process large amounts of data. But the step from there to like intelligence and autonomy and consciousness or whatever is just like this this is so far apart from me that like comparing two very unrelated things okay and i guess this kind of couples with it with the the lack of transparency how it affects um how making an when an ai system makes a decision it can affect of course um an explanation without oversight so or it can affect lives without without oversight so how how do you handle that i think we have to live with it you think that? We have to live with it. We have to live with it, okay. Um, I think the systems are just working very different to how we are used to reason. And it's very hard to sort of explain it. Um, 
Okay. The answer you expected, but <laughs> <laughs> not exactly, but no, but that's great. Okay. Um, I mean, there's just definitely a lot of value to sort of interpretability in certain settings and sort of um, also algorithmic recourse and having the right to know where algorithmic systems are at play. But the complex inner workings of like a neural net, how it maps like an input to a prediction mm -hmm. is, yeah, I find it hard to imagine that we can understand it fully. Okay. And with our previous guest, we also talked about the trustworthiness, like the tr trustworthy of our, our systems, trustworthy or not. Do you, what do you think? Do you think the AI systems are trustworthy or can people trust them? Um, that's like, I can't answer it in that generality. I think that's like one of the hard things that we need to solve. We need to know where we can use the technology and where we should not use the technology. Okay. There are certain things they are good at. Um, the systems are really strong at. Um, there are other things that we just simply cannot expect them to do. And I really think it's very important to to figure out just how to how to deal with it, so we can build reliable systems. So for you, there's a line of there's a, a sort of a limit of one we can use and one we can't. Um, so currently, there's definitely there are definitely limitations of the technology for things that we should not uh, use them for. This might change with like the advancements. This might shift. Okay. Um, that's that's hard to predict. Okay. Um, so we talked about so many different aspects, you know, your experience with um, on the industry side versus the impacts of AI, the impact that AI has uh, once it is brought to the market. Um, we talked about the societal aspects of it, the, the concerns, the misconceptions, the fears. And I want to know now, have your thoughts about AI changed over time? Uh, maybe a little bit. Maybe they might excite. Yeah. Um, it has changed in that at the beginning, I, I first had to learn what it is, right? Okay. How it works. Uh, it was, yeah. And once you understand it, you much more understand where the limits are. Just certain assumptions that we make, if they are violated, there's just no reason to believe that it will like work, trust work, work in and that we can trust it, right? Okay. Um, I still find it super amazing, right? How these like simple, some simple statistical methods allow for like this complex um, behavior or allow for something like fluent language. Uh, not many people would have thought that just by predicting the next word, you could generate such like naturally sounding language mm -hmm. without, no, without having like grammar or semantics or anything. I think that's like, it's really impressive. Um, I'm very excited about the field. Um, and are you more worried or more optimistic about AI? So is AI good or bad for the future? I think I want to be optimistic. I think it's just about figuring out how to use it. Uh, I think there's a lot of work that still needs to be done, of course. Um, but it's a lot about just like getting a sense for what it can and what it cannot do instead mm -hmm. of just throwing it at everything. Um, I think this would be crucial. And where do you see the trend going for the future? Where do you see AI in moving in which direction? It's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. I really don't know. I think the language is really cool, but I expect the hype to like dampen eventually and new things to become relevant again. Okay. Um, yeah, no, I, I can't tell you. It's, it's really hard to predict. Things have been evolving so quickly mm. in the field. Definitely. And changed so quickly, so. Okay. And so you're part of the Alice Institute Tübingen, uh, which is embedded in Cyber Valley community. And so what does that mean to you? How do you benefit from the AI community around you? Yeah, so I think it's a, it's a really great environment to be in. It's... Um, this um, blend of like industry, academia, then the Max Planck Institute, now the new Ellis Institute, which is part of it. It's a really like huge AI campus. I think it's probably one of the biggest ones in, in Europe. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really nice to have like this different perspectives 
and also different fields. I think that's also very important because the university covers so many areas. So there are a lot of like interesting intersections one can explore. There's like the AI and science cluster at the university, which sort of fuses AI and more of like the science and biology, chemistry, or just like very broad science. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think it's, it's a really, really nice environment. I really feel privileged to be part of it. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Celestine, for all of your input and sharing your knowledge with us. It was really informational and I think helpful for our listeners. Thank you very much for the conversation. And uh, remember, everyone, the conversation doesn't end here. Let's continue the dialogue. Until next time, we can keep exploring and staying curious and embracing the ever-evolving world of AI. You know, the future is unfolding before us. And I hope this has left you a little bit more inspired and informed. And, you know, thank you so much for being part of the future with us. Mm -hmm.